morning. Uh, this is lecture D. This is still in week two. This is the second lecture of week two. And we're going to finish up um, talking about um, the atom. So we've talked about uh, matter, types of material. We've talked about um, pure compounds and mixtures. Pure compounds can be either elements or compounds. We've talked about formulas and elements in the periodic table. And we've talked about mixtures, which are homogeneous mixtures or heterogeneous mixtures. Okay, so if you made coffee this morning or today, uh, you did a filtration to separate the heterogeneous mixture of coffee grounds from the uh, coffee liquid that passed through the filter paper in, the, in, your, in your coffee filter or Keurig filter or whatever, the Keurig pots, and uh, to produce um, your coffee. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna focus in on the atom. What exactly is an atom, all right? The theory actually uh, goes very far back in history. It started with uh, Democritus in about 500 BC. Now, this uh, philosopher just reasoned theoretically that if you had a rock, you could uh, break it in half to make two little uh, pieces of pebble. You could break that into half to make uh, two grains of sand. And then at some point, he reasoned, you would get to a fundamental unit that could no longer be uh, divided. But it would still be uh, the property of earth. Remember, they thought the, uh, there were four elements, air, earth, water, and fire. So the idea is that you could break a piece of earth small enough to get to a smallest indivisible unit, and that's what atom means. It means indivisible. It's the smallest piece of matter that cannot be divided or subdivided further. And uh, you see, that theory of his was promoted at a time when Socrates and other very famous philosophers were living. And Socrates did not adopt the theory. He disagreed with it. And uh, he was very popular, right? Socrates is well, very well known and Democritus not so well known. And uh, <clears throat> because of that, um, this idea was shelved, all right, for thousands of years. And later Dalton, John Dalton, a uh, English chemist, scientist, formulated uh, the precepts of chemistry, the atom, and um, he came up with the atomic theory. And this is a theory, right? Um, We've talked about laws, theories, and hypotheses, okay? So there's many, 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 many experiments to suggest that, yes, what we're going to write here on the board is true, okay? And there's a number of components of the theory, and I'll just write them here so you can have them, okay? So number one, all matter is made up of tiny particles called atoms. So I'm writing all matter equals tiny atoms. Number two, all atoms of a given element are similar to one another and different atoms, uh, different from atoms of other elements, okay? So uh, we've, you know, did a little show and tell yesterday, right? And um, we uh, discussed silver, for example, which is very shiny and reflective. And we talked about uh, sulfur, which is a non-metal, which is brittle, it's yellow, okay? And this is composed of a large amount of material, and you can break this down into the simplest silver atom, and you can break sulfur down into the simplest sulfur atom, but Dalton's theory is that those atoms should differ by some way, all right? If you take a bunch of silver atoms, and you, a silver sample, a silver coin, and you break it down into a bunch of silver atoms, a silver atom here and a silver atom here should be identical to one another, okay? In some, in some way. So 
So I will just state the uh, one of those statements here. All atoms of the same element are similar, okay, to, to itself. Number three, atoms of two or more different elements combine to form compounds, and this is very critical, okay? Atoms of two or more different elements combine to form compounds. A particular compound is always made up of the same kinds of atoms and always has the same number of each kind of atom. So we talked about water. It has the uh, chemical formula H2O. It's formed from two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. It's always those atoms, it's always in that ratio, and it's a constant composition, okay? So a drop of water uh, over here and a drop of water over there is going to contain exactly that ratio of atoms, okay? So uh, things in life are discrete, they're exact. They come in certain uh, whole number uh, ratios, okay? So that's the idea between uh, compounds, okay? So I will just rephrase it here on the board. Compounds are made of two or more atoms, okay? And uh, they're constant and they're predictable, okay? So water always has the same ratio of hydrogen and oxygen, and we now know it to be H2O, so we can predict the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in those compounds, okay? Number four, a chemical reaction involves the rearrangement, separation, or combination of atoms. Atoms are never created or destroyed during a chemical reaction, okay? So I'm gonna write here on the board. Now, we don't have to quibble about this, but there's a couple mistakes up here. Um, but it, it formed the basis of things, and he proposed this back in um, uh, this is like the 1700s, I think, or the early 1800s. So, number four says atoms rearrange in reactions, okay, and they are not created or destroyed. So that's the that's the basic premise we have going into chemistry. All right. Now. Uh, Dalton's atomic theory formed the basis of current atomic theory um, with some modifications of these statements, okay? But these are the small particles that we are talking about. While this is going, let me turn on the computer. I might need to uh, show some images later. Now, scientists are always looking at the sky with a telescope trying to see like how big the universe is and how vast it is and wow, look at this galaxy, how many billions of stars are in it, things like that. And uh, scientists are always looking uh, inwards to the smallest things. Uh, we're looking at cells and bacteria under microscopes and, and DNA and the nucleus and what is it made of and um, scientists even also look at the atom and they say, well, wait a minute, what is the atom? What is it made of? Are there, part of, are there subatomic particles? Can you actually break an atom into pieces? Or is it just a, a ball, a hard ball of, of something, of charge or something that can't be separated even further? Well, it turns out atoms can be separated. They are divided into smaller pieces. We call those subatomic particles. And uh, people um, at national labs that have access to um, particle accelerators like CERN in Switzerland, capital C-E-R-N, CERN, uh, is a super collider. They're uh, blasting particles at each other uh, at very high speeds to uh, shatter them to try to see what makes up uh, the fundamental pieces of matter, which are atoms or even, even the parts of atoms. Okay, let me go turn this computer back on.
One of the first discoveries into subatomic particles was in 1897 by J.J. Thompson. Um, it's surprising for me to think about this. Uh, you know, a little more than 100 years ago, uh, this guy here uh, was studying um, gases and charges and currents and things like this, and he discovered the electron. An electron is a fundamental particle. It uh, cannot be divided um, into smaller particles. It's the smallest uh, piece of matter, okay? And it's, it's in everything. It's in all types of atoms, whether it's a gas, a liquid, or a solid. Electrons, of course, are in electricity. That's where the name comes from. Um, it forms the basis of lightning, okay? When lightning strikes the ground, that's basically electrons returning through the sky. Um, static electricity, when you rub your hair on a balloon and it sticks to the wall, or you uh, are walking across a carpet and shock your hand on the door handle of your car or something like that. These are all um, evidence for the electron. Anyway, he was able to characterize it and measure it and study it. And uh, Thompson proposed what is called the plum and pudding model. What the heck is a plum and pudding model, okay? This is like fruit cake in England. Uh, some of you might know what fruit cake is. I talked to um, Dean Fox about this. I said, isn't it really nasty? Uh, because historically in the United States, you know, if your mother gave you a fruit cake, it was gross, uh, at least in my family. If your aunt or somebody made it, brought it over for the holiday. Uh, but he said it's good if it's made well, and I guess Plum and pudding comes from England. Okay, Thompson was an English scientist. Now, we're not too familiar with plum and pudding. Plum, uh, plum pudding. Uh, we're not familiar with the fruitcake. So we're gonna really truly Americanize this and we're gonna call this the chocolate chip cookie model. And if I was back in 1897, this is what I would call it and propose, okay? So what does this model look like? Imagine a dough of chocolate, uh, a, a dough, okay? Before you cook the uh, dough to make the cookie, just the dough, it's a spherical shape, right? And uh, within it are embedded chocolate chips, okay? So this is not a flat circle diagram you have to in your mind visualize what I am talking about when you have chocolate chip cookie dough in a bowl you grab a spoon right and it's a, it's kind of like a ball and you drop it on the cookie sheet this is your ball of cookie dough and what we have here in the middle are electrons And what holds those electrons in the atom is the dough, all right? And Thompson didn't know what that dough was. The, it was really nebulous. It was kind of like, I have no idea. I just know there's electrons in there. I don't know how they're held in the atom. I'm just gonna call it dough, okay? So the other stuff was unidentified. And, and this model makes three-dimensional uh, sense if you're thinking about your chocolate chip cookies, okay? The chocolate chip cookies are obviously held together by the dough, uh, which is comprised of, let's break it down, flour, butter, sugar, you know, stuff like that, right? So uh, the dough apparently holds these electrons in the atom. Why did he propose the dough? A fundamental property of matter that had been discovered before then was that like charges repel one another, okay? So if you have a negative charge, 
and you have a negative charge, these will be repelled from each other in opposite directions. I always put asterisks or stars on my lecture notes when I say something super important. So you should memorize this uh, fundamental physics principle that when you have two negatively charged things, they are going to repel one another, okay? You have heard the English expression, opposites attract, right? When it comes to uh, relationships, for example. Wow, that, that man and that woman are, woman are just completely opposite. How are they possibly a couple? And the response to that is, well, opposites attract, right? And so let's draw that situation here on the board. If I have a positive charge, and if I have a negative charge, those are going to be attracted to one another. I, dem I uh, mentioned that you can take a balloon, you know, blow it up with air and rub it on your hair, okay? And then it sticks to the wall. Why or how does that magically stick to the wall? Well, the balloon might be positively charged because when you're rubbing it on your hair, you're removing electrons, let's say, so it becomes positive. And the wall has a whole bunch of electrons, as I mentioned, the wall all atoms are made of electrons. So the positive balloon is going to be attracted to the negative wall. And so that's a magical kind of attraction, right? So opposites attract. And I'll just draw arrows going inwards towards one another. So this is the opposite charges are attracted. Up here, I decided to show a negative and a negative. I could have chosen a positive and a positive, okay? Two positive charges are like, and they will repel. Two opposite charges, a plus and a minus, are the only things we can pick, are going to be attracted to each other. When we go back to the model, we are going to see why this is apparent now. In a different color here, maybe uh, light blue, I'm going to put a minus sign in each one of these uh, little chocolate chips, okay, in each one of those electrons. Now you see this electron here and this electron here are going to be repelled from each other, okay? So they're just going to fly away apart gradually and there's going to be no atom. So Thompson realized this because he was studying the electron, he discovered the electron, he found out that it was negatively charged and they repel one another. So he had to come up with the idea that, well, the dough must be positive. Why? Well, this electron, yes, is gonna be repelled by this other electron and wanna go away, but it's going to be attracted to the cookie dough. It's gonna be sticky and it's gonna hold your chocolate chip in the cookie dough, okay? I hope that makes sense. So the cookie dough must have a positive charge. A positive or a bunch of positive charges again they didn't know just in case you can't read that statement let me read it to you the other stuff, which is dough, must have positive charge to hold the electrons together, okay? And that's uh, very important as well, okay? This model was the very first attempt to describe what the atom was. It was based on J.J. Thompson's discovery of the electron. And so, of course, he called this the plum and pudding model, but nowadays we call it the Thompson plum and pudding model because Thompson was a very hardworking scientist that discovered the electron, and we want to kind of pay tribute to him and say, hey, he was that, thank you for that. Great, good job. Okay. Now, along came a Rutherford who was also studying atoms. Okay, and let me show you a nice little figure of this.
might take a while to bring the camera up. Rutherford was a very important scientist who uh, performed this very famous gold foil experiment. This experiment is so iconic. Um, and the Rutherford model of the atom is called the nuclear model. And that's pretty much the latest and greatest. Uh, we have more advanced theories, but they're beyond this course. So this is the last thing we're gonna talk about when we uh, talk about atoms here, the nuclear model. So let me bring up that figure. All right, I'm gonna just snap a picture of this and we'll uh, annotate and draw on this here. There's lots of simulations and videos and uh, I guess more interesting things I could show here, but I'll just go with this uh, for now, okay? hit the wrong X. I'm trying to close the computer, but accidentally closed the, the board here. All right, so let me zoom in here as, as, as kind of a best I can uh, without overlaying any of my text that I've written here. Okay, and let's describe the experiment. Okay, so this is not the model of the atom. This is not the model of the atom. This is the experiment. Okay, And uh, what they had been, uh, scientists had been discovering for a while is radioactivity, okay? They learned that uh, some elements are radioactive, they're unstable, they spontaneously decompose and emit radiation, okay? And there's different forms of radiation. We'll learn about that later in the class. But uh, this is basically something called radium, okay? Radium is uh, something that glows in the dark. It was unfortunately used to uh, paint numbers on dials of watches so that they would glow in the dark so you could read the time in the middle of the night. And uh, radium emits something called alpha particles. It's basically uh, a, a, a small collection of uh, uh, an atom, basically a helium atom without electrons, and it's moving about 80% the speed of light, okay? So we have a lead block, all right, that has a nicely, very thin drilled hole in it and then inside of here is a radioactive sample, okay? And it's shooting particles out, okay? Alpha particles out of that small little hole, okay? So you can think of it as a gun, basically shooting bullets at very high speed at a target. And we don't know what 
the target is. We don't know what is actually in there, okay? Before we blast things at it, okay? So this was the beginnings of uh, particle physics, where you take a particle and you throw it at high speed at something else to see how it impacts or ricochets or rebounds to learn something more about the insides of that particle. Now what he had was a very thin gold foil. Gold has a very nice property of malleability. Maybe you've had a wedding uh, invitation with some gold leaf lettering on there. Maybe you've uh, seen an alcoholic drink with gold leaf floating around in there. Maybe you've seen a car with gold leaf uh, decals on it. Maybe you've seen the Statue of Liberty with the torch that's all shiny gold on it. It's not a whole lot of gold that's up there. It's just been hammered out to an extremely thin sheet. Gold can be hammered out extremely thin such that it's only like two or three atoms thick, okay? An extremely thin film, all right? And so we have the source of particles in this lead box, okay, with a small hole drilled into it. We have the beam of particles very nicely coming in in a very narrow uh, beam, okay? It's, it's not like a wide kind of thing. It's, um, we're very specifically aiming, all right, towards the center of this gold film, all right? Now, gold is element 79 in the periodic table. It's symbol AU. We've talked about it uh, before. So it's, it's, uh, it's right here above my finger, if you, can, if you can see that in the video, okay? So gold, once again, perhaps is a chocolate chip cookie, right? With some chocolate chips in there. And we're shooting a gun at cookie dough, trying to see what's gonna happen, right? We're gonna blast this atom apart and chocolate chip cookies are gonna go flying everywhere. Dough is gonna be flying everywhere. And from all of the stuff that goes flying, we're gonna try to figure out what is inside the cookie dough, is what, what kind of fruit is in the fruit cake, right? Now, when these particles impinged on the gold foil, a couple of things happened, which were um, not too surprising. Most of the particles went straight on through um, the, uh, the, the gold, which was very strange, okay? If, if, uh, it's almost like tissue paper, okay? So if you shoot a gun at a piece of tissue paper, the bullets are just gonna go right on through it. So you, you're, you're probably gonna draw the conclusion that um, it's mostly empty space or it's a very weak material and everything just goes flying on through that. Now, what was a little bit surprising, but expected, is that some of the particles were slightly deflected, okay? Now, you would not expect this if you were shooting a gun at a piece of tissue paper and some of the bullets bounced to the left. You'd be like, whoa, what was that? Maybe I hit a fence post or maybe I hit some metallic object that's down the target range. Now, what was extremely ex uh, exciting and very interesting and unique is that some of the particles rebounded backwards, okay? And I think Rutherford had this famous statement saying that it was like firing a shell from a battleship at something. And then surprisingly, that shell was bouncing right back at you, okay? Which was very surprising. A, a bullet, for example, has a lot of energy. And if even if you shoot into a concrete wall, it's very hard for that bullet to come bouncing back at you with exactly the same energy. It's gonna maybe bounce off a little bit or ricochet but these came right back, okay? From all of this data, he came up with the nuclear model of the atom. I don't have too much time to explain it all and, and, the, and the logic behind it, but here's the model. First off, the atom is mostly empty space because most of the beam of alpha particles being shot at the gold foil passed right on through it, undeflected. They just went right on through it like they didn't even see it, okay? So the idea is that most of the atom is empty space. So that, we're gonna talk about that, that little yellow dot there is the nucleus, okay? But most of the atom is empty space. Okay. 
Now, on top of this model, I'm gonna draw some things, but then I'll erase it. But if you shot a particle at this, the particle would just pass right on through the atom. There might be electrons, you know, in, in, in this, with outside of this blue circle or something, but most of it's empty space. So uh, your, your um, alpha particle or the bullet that you're shooting at this uh, chocolate chip cookie dough just passes right on through unscathed because it's mostly empty space. Here's another one, okay? We're just, it's just passing through the atom. It's mostly empty space, all right? Now I'm gonna remove those marks because it's not part of the model. It's part of the experiment. Point number two is that remember, some of these particles were hit at the gold foil and bounced right on back, all right? How do we explain that? Well, there's a very low chance, very improbable, that you score a bullseye hit right on the nucleus if a, an alpha particle comes in and hits this, it's going to bounce back, okay? It's going to bounce back. That's very unlikely. It's very improbable. But for that to happen, that has to have a very high positive charge. The alpha particle that you're shooting at this, think of it as a bullet that has a positive charge. And we've talked about a positive charge that could be repelled by another positive charge. If our bullet is positively charged and the nucleus is positively charged, then those two particles are gonna repel each other, okay? And it's possible for that to ricochet backwards. So in the middle of this atom is the nucleus. It's extremely small. And that's where all the positive charge is located. This wasn't accepted uh, for many years after these stunning results, because once again, how are you gonna keep a bunch of positive charges in close proximity without them pushing away each other, right? So they had to modify the theory to explain a little bit about what was in that, okay? So they had to view in, <laughs> you know, zoom in a little bit and try to understand, hey, what's in the nucleus, all right? So what is the relative size of this, okay? Let's use a couple of analogies. If you like baseball, we'll talk about baseball. If this is the size of a marble, how big would the size of the atom be, all right? So you have to think about baseball, go to a baseball stadium, major league baseball stadium, and take a marble, put it on home plate, okay? And how big would the atom be? The atom would be as large as the baseball stadium itself, okay? And that's a lot of empty space, okay? The marble on home plate is where all this stuff is. We don't know yet, I haven't talked about it yet, but that's where all the positive charge is located, in that little marble. And most of the atom is just empty space. You might have a couple of fans walking around, you might have security walking around, you might have a cleaning crew walking around picking up some you know, popcorn uh, or something, right? Those are the electrons that are just kind of like in the atom, okay? But it's mostly empty space. Fine, you don't watch football, or uh, baseball, I mean. Imagine uh, the distance between Danville and Greensboro. Your head is about the size of a soccer ball or something like that, right? So if the nucleus here in yellow is the size of a soccer ball, the atom is going to be as large as from like here to Greensboro, okay? And that's mostly empty space. If you think about the drive you take from here to Greensboro, there's Reedville, there's bunch of farms and pretty much nothing, right? In between Danville and Greensboro. All right, so all of this is empty space. Kind of like the solar system, right? You know, you know, you have the sun, which might be the nucleus, and you have maybe Earth going around in the orbit, and in between there's like a whole bunch of nothing. All right, here's the model of the atom not to scale. In your nucleus, you're gonna have protons, you're gonna have neutrons, and 
then outside of that, you're going to have electrons. So you can draw this any way you kind of want, okay? So it's not to scale because that's about the size of, uh, you know, a soccer ball or something. So I'd have to draw these electrons like miles away, all right? I can't do that. So that's why I'm saying it's not to scale. You need to understand that. Now, in the middle of the atom is called the nucleus. You see red okay? I don't think you can. Let me do it in uh, yellow. In the middle of the atom is the nucleus. So that whole collection of particles that's overall positively charged is the nucleus. Okay? Now we use abbreviations for these particles. We talked about how these proton uh, these uh, the nucleus is positively charged and it's composed of protons which have a positive charge. Now, as I mentioned, if this particle is positively charged and that particle is positively charged, they're going to repel each other. So Rutherford proposed that there must be something else in there holding the protons together. It wasn't until later that Chadwick discovered the neutron and the neutron is like the nuclear glue that holds the protons together much like uh, at a Thanksgiving dinner, for example, your aunt visits town and your, a couple of your cousins or something, your niece or whatever, are fighting uh, with um, each other. And so uh, the, the parent has to sit in between those uh, two kids that always fight, and then it holds the family together, right? So let's summarize on the next page what these things do, okay? So E with a little circle, that's an electron. It has um, a charge of minus one, okay? And it's extremely massless. It's very lightweight, okay? Its charge is approximately zero, okay? So that's the electron. We've talked about that. Now the proton actually isn't the cookie dough. It's this uh, really small particle that's in the nucleus. And we call that the proton. Okay. It's spelled P-R-O-T-O-N, but we abbreviate it P. And the charge of a proton is plus one. Okay. And its mass is one atomic mass unit. Okay. Don't worry about the, the, uh, the units here. I'll just write atomic mass units, A-M-U, if you want to look it up. We won't do any um, serious math with, with any of this stuff, all right? And what is, the, what is the purpose of the proton? Let me squeeze it into this summary table. The purpose of the proton, since it's positive, is going to attract the electrons to it, okay? So the protons are in the middle of the nucleus, much like the sun is the middle of our galaxy. And the purpose of the sun is to hold the Earth in orbit in the solar system, okay? So the proton is positively charged and it exerts a pull or a force on all the oppositely charged negative electrons to hold them into the atom, okay? So this holds the electrons in the atom. And I'll spell it out. So in a sense, it, it is kind of like a dough that holds the electrons there. The next particle we talked about is the neutron. We give it a little symbol N. Its charge is zero, okay? Its charge is uh, zero, okay? Uh, its mass is one. What is the purpose of a neutron again? Well, all of these protons have to be crammed in this really small nucleus in the middle of an atom and the neutron is the nuclear glue that holds the protons together. It uses something called the nuclear strong force, but we don't need to get into that, okay?
that neutrons and protons are composed of even smaller particles called quarks, but we are not going to talk about this in this very basic level science course, okay? So that is essentially what you've got there in terms of the nuclear model, okay? All of the mass of an atom is from the nucleus, okay? Because electrons have a mass of about zero. So the mass of this atom would be one, two, three from the three neutrons, one, two, three from the three protons, or a total of six mass units. All these electrons out here have a mass of about zero. What is the total charge of this atom? Well, each proton has a charge of plus one, right? So plus one and plus one and plus one is plus three. Each electron is minus one, so it's minus one, minus one, minus one, that's minus three. And so a plus three and a minus three are balanced out and come out to be zero. So the overall charge of this atom is zero. It's got plus three charge in the nucleus from the three protons. It's got a minus three charge out in the perimeter from the negative one uh, charged electrons. And remember, neutrons have a charge of zero, so that does not affect the charge. But the overall charge of an atom is gonna be neutral. You have equal amounts of minus charge and equal amounts of positive charge, okay? So that, that was a lot. Let me uh, grab my notes. Now for this very basic class, we're just gonna use atomic mass units to calculate the mass of a single atom. We're not gonna do too much, too much with that, okay? First, I wanna talk about atomic number. Atomic number is defined as the number of protons that an atom has. And it's what defines the element if we're talking about uh, the periodic table. So um, I seem to have, oh, here's my periodic table. <laughs> Print out a periodic table if you have not already. I mean, just like pause the video, run the library, print something out. And so when you look at a, uh, a periodic table, you'll see a whole number uh, on the periodic table. Okay, so for example, if we want to look at hydrogen here, there's a number one there on this periodic table. If we want to look at carbon, there's a number six on this periodic table. Gold, we had mentioned earlier in this same lecture, has a number of 79 on this periodic table. And so that is the number of protons in the nucleus for each of these atoms. Okay. The element number or atomic number of hydrogen is one. So that means hydrogen has one proton in the nucleus. Carbon is six. I'm making a little box around this as though you could see that on your periodic table somewhere. Uh, it might be up on the top, it depends. Your periodic table might show the one up here on the upper left, or it might show it at the, at the very top. It, it just depends on where it is, okay? It doesn't matter. But once again, we're looking at the whole number. Uh, don't look at the 1.0079 number for hydrogen or the 12.011 number for the carbon. We're not gonna be using those numbers in this class, okay? So just look at the number six, that's the whole number. This is carbon, and we can say carbon has six protons. Okay, so that's the definition of the atomic number. It's the element number, and remember how we talked about the periodic table, there are 118 different elements. So it means element 118, magnesium, has 118 protons in the nucleus. Hydrogen is the simplest element, it has just one proton in the nucleus, and you can see how we have all the way up to 118. So this is a very key thing to realize that elements differ 
based on the number of protons in the nucleus, okay? If I asked you what element has three protons in its nucleus, you would have to grab the periodic table and find element number three, lithium, okay? So elements differ based on the number of protons. Elements differ based on the number of protons they have. I put an asterisk there. This key, this, this key statement ties back into Dalton's law, which states that all atoms are different, right? We had previously held up silver and sulfur, and silver has, are composed of atoms with 47 protons, and this is sulfur. Sulfur is composed of atoms with 16 protons, okay? So the atoms are going to be different in that regards. Now, what is mass number? Mass number is defined as the sum of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Okay, so add the number of protons and add the number of neutrons up, and you got what's called the mass number. Okay, don't worry about the units there. They're called atomic mass units, but don't worry about the units there, okay? So, for example, let's draw a little picture. I won't draw all the orbits, but uh, we've got four E's, four electrons. We've got four P's, uh, which are protons, and we've got uh, five N's, which are neutrons. And we want to know what is the mass number here, okay? So we count them up. There are one, two, three, four protons. And then we add that to the number of neutrons, which are five, okay? And that gives us a total of nine, okay? So we say that for this picture, at least, that has a mass number of nine, okay? Well, what element is this? What are we even talking about, okay? And that's another question. As I mentioned, you count up the number of protons. There's one, two, three, four, four protons. So you grab the periodic table that you printed out and you try to find the number four on it, okay? And uh, if you look right below my finger, you can see beryllium is number four. I think it's with two L's. Beryll beryllium is the name of that element. The symbol is capital B, small e. So pay attention to the question. If it asks for the name, you have to type it all out, beryllium. And if it asks for the symbol of the element, you got to type capital B, lowercase e. All right, so that's the mass number.
isotopes, a very key term here that um, you'll want to write down as you're taking notes, as you're watching the video or reading the textbook. Isotopes are defined as uh, atoms of the same element, okay, the same element. So we got an oxygen atom here, we have an oxygen atom here. They have the same number of protons. Oxygen, let's take a look at that. In the periodic table is element number eight. Capital O is oxygen and it's number eight. So if I have an oxygen atom in my right hand, it's gonna have eight protons and an oxygen atom in my left hand, it's also going to have eight protons, okay? So that's what defines the element, O and O, oxygen and oxygen. But they could have different numbers of uh, neutrons in the nucleus. One could have, for example, seven neutrons. Another could have eight neutrons. They would just have different weights, but they would still have the same element name or symbol, uh, but they have different weights, so they're called isotopes, okay? So let's take a look at um, oxygen, what I just said. So you've got eight protons. And we'll draw eight neutrons in here. Okay, and over on the right, we're gonna draw an element that has eight neutron, eight protons, I mean. And over here, seven neutrons. I'm not gonna draw all the electrons. Let's just focus on the nucleus at the moment. And so let's tally up what we have. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight protons. Over here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So no mistakes yet, that's good. So once again, we can look in the periodic table and we know that something with eight protons is oxygen. So this is the nucleus of an oxygen atom, and over here as well, it's the nucleus of an oxygen atom, okay? But these atoms differ. They differ a little bit because they have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. So they're the same element, but they're different because they have different masses or different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. On the left, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight neutrons. Okay, and on the right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, only seven neutrons, so that's fine. So given the picture, given this information, we can count the protons, count the neutrons, and calculate the mass number. Remember that the mass number is simply acquired by adding these two numbers together. So eight and eight is 16. And over here, eight plus seven is 15. And we have a very succinct symbol to uh, indicate what isotope we are talking about. And that's always indicated with a hyphen after the element name. So oxygen 16 would be an isotope and over here, oxygen 15 would be a different isotope, okay? So these are isotopes, oxygen 16, for example, and oxygen 15, for example, okay? So that's how you classify or label or even describe what the isotope is, okay? Let's do another problem. I'm kind of running out of time, but uh, this, this is pretty much the, well, I don't have time to talk about what I want to talk about, so I'll, I'll elaborate more on this and we'll stop after isotopes.
Here's a sample question. Describe lithium-7 with a drawing. Step one is to find lithium on your periodic table, okay? There's 118, so you have to go through them all. What I see here is that it's located right here by my uh, finger. Lithium is element number three. I'm listing the procedure here out, step one, step two, step three, so you can see and follow along as I'm doing it. Remember what that element number means. It means it has three protons in the nucleus. So grab your pen or pencil and draw one, two, three protons in the nucleus. Now remember that atoms that are neutral, we're talking about atoms that are neutral here, have equal numbers of protons and electrons. Okay, so I'm just writing out um, that statement there. So here's our atom. We don't want to put the electrons in the nucleus, right? We want to kind of put them outside. So we have, and we want three of those. So put one, two, you know, three over here. It's, it looks fine, okay? So, so far we've got two out of the three. We've got the protons, electrons. Now we have to think about the neutrons, okay? For the neutrons, we have to use this number here, this number here, okay? and we need to use a little bit of basic math to figure that out. So let me show you carefully how that's done. The mass number for this isotope is seven. Okay, everybody follow along so far? That number that's followed by a hyphen is the mass number, okay? And remember uh, two slides back or three slides back what the mass number is equal to. We add up the protons and the neutrons to get that. Okay, so protons plus neutrons is equal to seven. In the previous steps, I had determined that we have three protons, three protons. There are three protons here, and I want to know how many neutrons there are. To equal seven. And we can just solve this in our head. Three plus four is seven, right? Three plus four is seven. So on this diagram, I'm going to write that down here. I'm gonna go ahead on this diagram and write out one, two, three, four. It doesn't matter where you put them, they could be right in between the protons or whatever. So there's four neutrons, three protons, and three electrons. So that is a very brief <laughs> a phrase or description, but if you're able to draw this, you understand everything about the charge and the mass and the location of protons and neutrons and electrons. I'm out of time, but that's it for uh, describing atoms. Thanks for watching and have a great, uh, a great day.